steps on our path. I'm going to start with a quote that is from the letters of Helena Rourke. And when she talks about traps on our path, she is talking about entrapment. So I'm going to read through this slowly so it really will sink in and, and really make sense. She says, you do not understand the meaning of this word, but it seems so clear to me. The better part of our being can help us to recognize an old debtor or creditor during karmic encounters. And then precisely our straight knowledge can prompt us to cautiousness and actions that accord with the situation. But indeed, in most cases, thoughtless touching upon his many-hued past entraps man, and he again and again gives in to any and every feeling, thus making his own karma more burdensome, so that it will drag behind him in, two, in numerous existences. So I was really thinking about this thoughtless touching. What is thoughtless touching? That, that took a little uh, bit of doing because of the translation. And I think thoughtless touching means that we're not aware of these patterns that we continually allow to direct our lives, whether they're emotional, physical, mental patterns. These patterns start at birth. And if you know anything about astrology, you know astrology is based on primarily on karmic patterns. And then esoteric astrology comes in and helps us loosen these patterns to free our soul into greater light. So it means working on ourselves. But the idea here with entrapment based on what Helena Rourke is saying by recognizing an old debtor or creditor that this starts right at birth. So the old debtor and the creditor doesn't have to be a person. It can be an experience, a condition, a situation, a pattern that we keep touching and thoughtlessly bring back into our life and live it again and again. Then from the book Agni Yoga, verse 192, it says a yogi is tested continually by his teacher and in the same way, a yogi tests those who come to him. Adaptability, the master says, is the best way to deal with the traps of life. A yogi appraises instantaneously the value of goal fitness. Adaptability. I'm going to talk a little bit more about adaptability because it probably isn't what you really think it is. So traps. We want to think about traps. Traps are those situations or conditions that prevent or hinder our spiritual progress. So a person might think, but I'm not on a spiritual path. You know, I'm on the path of increasing my influence, of becoming a better professional, of being the head of the corporation, you know, of moving to a better, a better neighborhood, getting a bigger car. I was watching the Today program this morning, and they were interviewing a woman in her mid-20s who is, she said in her, by the time she was 25, she made, she made $4.5 million. 
what's she going to do with the rest of her life? <laughs> the thing is, whether we are aware that we're on a spiritual path or not, we are. As long as we have a soul, that soul is the one that keeps pushing us forward, inspiring us to do something different, inspiring us to change ourselves, inspiring us to be creative. What deters this process, the process of progress, would be traps. So these traps sometimes prevent us from moving ahead by slowing us down by a year or 20 years or lifetimes. So these traps are really important. As I talk about them this morning, uh, not to be resistant. And, and I had to do this myself because I had, how am I going to get up and talk about this when I'm aware of my traps, my own traps? <laughs> And I thought, well, it's going to make it more realistic, more than just words, you know, coming out of the teaching, but the realization, okay, I have some traps, you know, and I don't like them because they are preventing my own physical, emotional, mental, spiritual freedom. So I hope you will feel the same way. So we know these traps come to our life many, many times. Sometimes they come from the inside. Sometimes they come from the outside. But these traps do come. Today I'll share some of the signs of the traps and also how to overcome them. But the master is very clear in saying that adaptability is the best way to deal with the traps of life. What does Agni Yoga tell us about adaptability? The teaching says adaptability is the best means for conservation of our forces. Often is asked how to develop this quality. Here's the answer. The development of adaptability actually takes place in the currents of life. It takes place in the currents of life. In other words, the yogi must be able to change or to be changed in order to fit or work better in some situation or for some purpose. So adaptability is found in those who know how to positively use that creative or psychic energy, their life energy plus straight knowledge. Now, the opposite of adaptability is what? Rigidity. What? Rigidity. Rigidity, absolutely. Stubbornness, uh, refusal to change, or even to expand. Thus, the great sage tells us that adaptability is the best way to deal with the traps of life. Some traps are set from previous lives or from our old psychology, state of consciousness, or emotions. And sometimes we are trapped by others. Those who trap others, listen to this, it's so interesting. Those who trap others are trapped people. No one will try to trap us into situations and conditions in which our spiritual growth and progress will be stopped if that person, him or herself, is not trapped. <clears throat> so it's the trapped people that are going to trap us. And it's the people that live in freedom that are going to encourage us to move forward on our spiritual path through freedom or through those great principles that Torquem talks about, you know, through beauty and goodness and righteousness and joy and sacrificial service. A free person wants everyone free around him, but a trapped person wants company in his cage. 
<laughs> For example, when a little child is lying, what does he do? He wants all of his friends to lie with him. So he puts all of the others in his own trap, and now birds of a feather, you know, travel together. Okay. <laughs> An adult is going to try to, try to gather those who are in some way beholding to him into his camp to justify his actions and thus create divisions. So here are some of the signs of traps from the teaching. When we say, I really wish I hadn't done that, that is a sign that we were trapped. I really wish I hadn't have done that. If you remember a time you said that, then go back to look at the cause. What made you say that? I wished I hadn't have done that. Many times, perhaps you said, I wish I did not say that. We are either out or in a trap. We cannot be both, either out of a trap or in a trap. But you're going to find that mostly people are in a trap. Complaining is another sign. <laughs> I know, this is like, oh, how am I going to talk about this? <laughs> but this is the reality. Immediately you see you're complaining, you're going to realize that you're trapped in some part of your nature, physically, emotionally, mentally. Like, I am so tired today. Okay, what time did you go to bed last night? What did you do yesterday? What about your nutritional program? The interesting. It is beneficial to find out where we are trapped mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. It's interesting to think that we can also be trapped spiritually. I've got a great story I'm going to share in a couple of minutes about that. It is important to see where we are trapped because when we are trapped, our heart is not happy. Even if you show signs of happiness, you can be unhappy inside. An unhappy woman or man invites all kinds of troubles and sicknesses into their life. An unhappy person, for example, gossips. An unhappy person irritates. An unhappy person slanders. And an unhappy person always tries to use others for his own advantage. So here's a story about how we can be trapped spiritually. Yogi Rinpoche, Rinpoche was wandering as a medicant. He was a precious teacher. When he heard about this renowned student or hermit, who had lived long in the solitary seclusion, he decided he better go visit him and see what he was doing. He suddenly entered this cave unannounced and peered about with a wry grin on his weathered face. Where have you come from, said the hermit, and where are you going? The Rinpoche said, well, I came from behind my back, and I'm going in the direction I am facing. The hermit was nonplussed, but continued, where were you born? On earth? Was the reply, well, that would be a great answer for prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help it. Hmm. By that time, the hermit was becoming agitated. What is your name, the hermit demanded. Yogi beyond action, replied the unexpected guest. Rinpoche then inquired as to why he had come to live 
And so why did the student, why did the hermit come to live such a wild, in such a wild and remote part of the country? This was the question the hermit was prepared to answer. He said, I have been here for 20 years in meditation. At this time, I'm meditating on the perfection of patience. All this was said not without a touch of pride. Well, now that's a good one, said the anonymous visitor. And then leaning forward, as if confiding something to him, the Rinpoche whispered, a couple of old frauds like us could never manage anything like that. The angry hermit rose abruptly from his seat. You're a liar, he exploded. <laughs> Who do you think you are disturbing my retreat like this? What made you come here? Why couldn't you leave a humble practitioner like me to meditate in peace? And now, my dear friend, said the Rinpoche calmly, where is your perfect patience? <laughs> what was the hermit's trap? Perhaps pride, perhaps his so-called holiness. Did you see that the hermit was blind? He did not even recognize his teacher, the Rinpoche. One of the quotes I shared in the first part of the talk this morning was, a yogi is continually tested by his teacher. The hermit had been in meditation for 20 years, practicing patience. After 20 years, the Rinpoche had to travel to find his student to see if he was yet free from his self-imposed traps of many lifetimes, one of which was asceticism. In just a few minutes, the Rinpoche ripped away the hermit's delusions. We cannot put our personality into a cave to practice spirituality. See, that's old age. That's Piscean age. Now it's in the mall, <laughs> so to speak. The hermit had been trapped for 20 years, thinking that he was on his way to becoming holy. Today's more modern student becomes trapped in his or her book knowledge and his book's knowledge of which oftentimes increases his egotism, his sense of superiority. He must put the knowledge he learned into practice. Or like the hermit, he will spend many years trapped in delusion and illusion. Now, toward the middle of July, I'm going to be talking more about illusion and intuition. It's just going to be very interesting. Okay, so anger. Anger is another trap. It is a sign that we want to jump out of our cage, our physical cage, emotional cage, mental or spiritual cage. We need to ask ourselves, why are we angry? Psychologically, we are in prison, and we do not see it. See? And this means we're trapped. Who can tell you that you are trapped? Only someone like the Rinpoche, the teacher who is not trapped. From outside, he must come and say, get out. You may say, you don't understand, I'm fine. <laughs> the problem is, the reason we think we're fine is because we're so used to these traps, these patterns, see, from previous lives, from childhood, from wherever these patterns began. 
So we don't even know that we want to escape, even if we're unhappy on the inside. So the trap becomes more normal to us. Like birds in a cage, when the door is open, they do not come out. Unhappiness is a sign of a trap. So why are you unhappy? Because you are in a trap. <laughs> so freedom, freedom never makes us unhappy. Now, freedom is not rebelliousness. You know, our kids think that being rebellious is being independent, and being independent is being free. And right away, they're trapping themselves. <laughs> Freedom never makes us unhappy. We argue. Now, here's a very simple example. You want to go to this restaurant, and your friend says, no, we're going to go to that restaurant. And you go. <laughs> See, this is so simple. It's a little trap, a little simple trap, but we don't recognize it. And then we pout, and we go to that restaurant. <laughs> And we don't know we're trapped. Now, if you can take this simple example and make it more complex, you're going to see how the complexities of our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual life have trapped us. Dogmas and doctrines are traps. I am a wealthy person is a trap. on a news program this morning. I had a lot of free time this morning. <laughs> they were talking about Hillary Clinton's money and the Clinton Foundation and how much money they have. And, and so here comes Hillary Clinton in the first part of you know, her campaign, trying to be as if she doesn't have act, as if she has no money, as if she's not a millionaire many, many times over, or as if the Clinton Foundation is poor. It's a trap. See that? Think about it. I have so many millions of dollars in the bank. That's a trap. Back in the 30s, they were jumping out windows because they lost it all. We must be able to see that this is a trap, whatever this is. So we want to progress. Well, most of us want to progress. I can't imagine anybody saying, no, I want to stay the same. <laughs> so let's think about this. What are the signs that we are progressing? This is interesting. The first sign is that we have an increasing field of service. Doing things for others say, without ego or expectation. That's spiritual progress. So increasing service rendered toward others without ugly purpose or expectation is spiritual progress. This can be something very, very simple. It's like my kids drove up in Phoenix yesterday, and we have this problem that most of you know I'm dealing with, is I have a, four dogs, and one of them is a jumper. And he can jump over anything <laughs> to get out of his trap. <laughs> So every weekend they come up from Phoenix and we try to f escape proof the lower deck. So here they were yesterday. We went to Home Depot. They were thinking the, the kids were not the dogs. The kids <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how we're going to escape proof it this week. <laughs> so it took a lot of creative thinking. And then we went back to the house and here's Jeff climbing up of the railing and putting this big 
fence and kind of a wobbly looking fence and from the top deck down to the lower deck. It was tremendous effort. Even getting up on top of the rail, you know, was fun to watch. <laughs> and they were so excited, you know, about the result. They never complained about all the three hours of labor that went into it. You know, they were excited because why? They were helping mom. Probably tired of me talking about Bailey escaping. <laughs> but see, something simple like that, and of course, I had so much joy because they didn't want anything in return. They were just trying to help me out. And that's spiritual progress. So as I'm thinking about, look how my kids are progressing, you know, by helping me out. And they do that with other people as well. It's spontaneous. It's in their bones. It is a great principle, increasing service rendered toward others without ugly motives and expectations. Another sign is increasing creative work. You can be creative in your home, with your spouse, in your society, in your group, or your church. A creative person always creates more ways and means through which other people can become happier. So that little act, action that the children took yesterday, my adult children took yesterday, left me happy this morning because I could put the dogs out in that lower deck, come out here without a worry that I'll come home to one missing dog. <laughs> Something so simple. How can we make our environment and the people in our environment happier. If our children, if our friends and co-workers are crying or becoming increasingly unhappy being around you, then you are not serving. Creativity means to create those ways and means by which we make our environment healthier, happier, more pure, and more beautiful. If you are creative, you will find different ways to make everyone happy, especially those around and about you. But most men and women are professionals at trapping each other. See, just watch it. Now that you're aware of it, Watch it happen. Sometimes it can be so subtle that we're not aware of it, but now we're going to be aware of it. I've counseled many people, and I see their problems. Try to understand these things totally, but see, if that person is trapped, if you are trapped, you're not going to understand it. Increasing expansion of consciousness is the third one. People say, I'm enlightened. I mean, you know, I've been around the block a long time now with spiritual groups, spiritual leaders, and it's so easy to tell who is enlightened and who is not. I don't listen to what they say anymore. Hey. I want to look at their accomplishments, you know, their honesty, you know, their humility. Because to me, honesty and integrity and humility is the path to enlightenment. So I'll say, tell me what it means that you are enlightened. Show me. Show me that you are enlightened. 
so if you think you're enlightened, <laughs> don't spend 20 years trapped in your cave of traps. See what I'm saying? See, to me, a humble person is not afraid to acknowledge there's some traps you know, in the physical, emotional, mental, even spiritual life. Let it happen so that we can get rid of it. Someone told me one day he had gone to all the groups and knows everything. I told him then this is not the right group for him. Enlightenment is not going to come from one group, going from one group to the next group. There is a lineage that we try to follow. The fourth, closer contact with our higher self is a sign of spiritual progress. So daily, for just a few minutes, ask yourself, what is controlling me today? My emotions and my actions, my thinking process. What is controlling me? Is it your higher self? One contact with your higher self, you're going to be totally different. Now, it doesn't mean that other people are going to see this or recognize it. And honestly, it doesn't make any difference. What's important is that you have seen it yourself. You've had the contact with that higher self, that one moment of contact. And now you are free from so many of these many incarnations of traps. Expansion of consciousness and spiritual progress is proven when our light is shining and when we're under the control of that light. Not under the control of our hallucinations and illusions and glamours and maya. In other words, our yes is yes and our no is no. Do you understand? Fifth, the teaching reminds us that expanding love is spiritual progress. Spiritual progress can be achieved if situations and conditions are not preventing or hindering our progress. So expanding love, love is always part of the formula. Now, <laughs> there are other things that we're trapped in. They're kind of heavy. <laughs> uh, well, if I have time today, I can get into it and then run. <laughs> <laughs> or we could stop and ask questions. Should I run? Or, <laughs> no, ask question. Well, let me see. I'll just kind of touch on it. The teaching tells us that physical sicknesses are traps. That's a tough one. Traps give way to more traps. For example, we trap ourselves with drinking and doping, and they, it, these things make ourselves sick. We get others trapped because we ourselves are trapped. A healthy body does not have a trap. Or maybe someone else trapped you by giving you a sickness. Or someone closest to you has trapped you. See, all these things can be the causes of physical sickness. Emotional traps. Emotional traps consume our time and energy and pollute our system. For example, arguments 
create traps. How many times do we read in the teaching, particularly in Agni Yoga, <clears throat> don't waste your time <coughs> arguing. And if you've ever <laughs> You know why it wastes your time. It's consuming. It's all consuming. Because once we begin to complain, <laughs> which gives way to arguing, it begins to build up and affect our nervous system. And then we can't stop it. And then we begin to fabricate. And we create a whole chapter or maybe many chapters in a book about the justifications of why we need to argue what's wrong with you, what you did wrong. You know, and it goes on and on and on. So, emotional traps that consume our time and energy pollute our system. And the other is depression. Depression is another great trap. Depression is frequently caused by a realization of our past faults without conscious awareness. Faults and errors accumulate and begin to cause depression. They come to the surface. Depression can be a sign of having done many, many wrong things. Whenever we are depressed, Whenever you are depressed, be careful. See, and then analyze it. You know, be honest with yourself and analyze it. See if there are things that you are doing wrong. Now, you don't have to go to your friend or to your spouse or to your kid or even to your poor little dog, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and talk to them. Go to a tree. Go outside. Go out to our meditation garden or in your own quiet moment, try to analyze and see, okay, if I'm a little depressed today, see if there are some things that I'm doing wrong. Because depression is a trap, and it imprisons us. Freedom is so important physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual freedom. But freedom is only gained by spiritual progress. So you can imagine what it was like putting this talk together. <laughs> I've got a whole list. <laughs> well, not that. I've got some. You know, I think it's very, for me, it was very exciting to see where these traps are. And I know they're not going to be hard, I mean, easy, you know, to overcome, but recognition and acknowledgement, analyzing it, and then creating a plan of how to change and get out of these traps, it's going to be an adventure in itself. Very exciting. Okay, so that's it. Uh, were there any questions from the our viewers? Okay. Do you have any questions? Not one. <laughs> we're all trapped. Coward. We're all trapped. <laughs> I know. Don't feel it. <laughs> okay, a year from now. <laughs> We're going to walk in the front door with this great sense of freedom. And look at what I dug myself out of. Oh, I'm no longer a caged bird. <laughs>